Hello and welcome to Transforming Tomorrow, the podcast from the Pentland Centre for Sustainability in Business here at Lancaster University Management School. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jane Bevington. Jan, we're asking for trouble today. We've got two people in the studio who are here and ready and riled up for mischief. So we're joined by Brian Gregory and Salma Acher to discuss our Entrepreneurs in Residence scheme here in Lancaster University Management School. Brian's the director of the programme. He's a former entrepreneur in residence himself. He leads a network of more than 90 EIRs from around the world in many different sectors. He's also researching his PhD. Doesn't sound to me like he's got enough on his plate. Needs a few more things to be doing. And Salma is the business networks officer from here in Lancaster University Management School, which essentially she means she keeps the entire network in check and doing what they should be doing. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. And, and I'd love to take issue with this troublesome tag you seem to put on us, <laughs> but we're going to have to get over that early, aren't we? I think time will tell. Time uh, will tell. Starting with you then, Brian, just a bit of an introduction to you. I have said, you know, you are the director of the EIR scheme, uh, but you're also an EIR yourself. Um, that's how you came to be in, involved with it. Just, yeah, how have you come to be involved with the whole EIRs and where you are now? Right then, so I'll try and do something fairly potted. Um, back in about 2006, Magnus George and Ellie Hamilton came up with the idea of the Entrepreneur in Residence. Now then, Entrepreneur in Residence isn't new. There are universities around the world that do similar types of versions. And in reality, work I'm doing now all universities have a scheme that looks like this. It may be called something different. So 2006-07, Ellie and Magnus conjured an idea, got some ERDF funding, and then brought in a fellow called Ian Gordon, who's now returned back to Lancaster again. And Ian became uh, an employed entrepreneur in residence at Lancaster. Ian worked for three or four years with a number of people who've been associated with Lancaster from the past through programmes like LEAD, which are relatively well-known or were relatively well-known, until the point came where Ian developed the Entrepreneur in Residence Program as it looks like now to the point where we took on free resource. These were friends of the university who are in business who would be happy to come in and give to the to the university, uh, but there's, there's, there, there is a reciprocal arrangement uh, uh, there. So I was one of the first 10 that were brought in as a trial to see could we make this model work, and I have remained involved since then. Which obviously suggests the model did work, otherwise all these years later they wouldn't have kept you. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> still here. So what's your current role then? What does it involve being the director of the scheme? R- roles are sort of, I suppose, easy to put down on bits of paper, aren't they? And then difficult to hold people to afterwards. I am trying to increase spread capability, resource. It's, it's about expanding Lancaster beyond Lancaster's boundaries. How do we get into bed with other universities in other parts of the world who do other things, who do different stuff? If they're doing different stuff and we can go and show them ours, they might show us theirs and we get to bring that back to Lancaster. And that's only hugely beneficial for Lancaster as an organisation, but our students as a whole as well. So to bring you in line with the podcast, here, so what, what's your take on sustainability in business personally then? I know when I saw this question, I thought, how, how do you answer that? So I'm going to suggest that there are some evangelical folk out there who love it and all have their own reasons as well. I think there's a big element of needs must. I, I, re- I remember a few years ago in my last business, there was a, an ISO standard that became relevant and it started to gain impact in its relevance. And all of a sudden, everybody in our industry is thinking, I'm going to have to go and get ISO a, B and C, aren't I? So the, there's, there's a balance out there about what sustainability is and why we adopt sustainability. But I still think it's primarily customer driven, not product driven. I'm going to ask the question because I don't know the answer to this. What's an ISO? International Standards Organisation. So they produce sort of like how-to guides for environmental management, but all sorts of other topics as well, the same way as the British Standards Institute um, has guidelines of that sort. So they are sort of like how-to guides for businesses, organisations to be able to figure out stuff that they might need to know. Yeah, and they try and set that up on an international basis rather than a national basis so that we can compete with the US on what might look like a level-ish playing field. Salma, let's come to you then. So 
a bit about yourself and how you've come to be in charge. Uh, and I will say, I, I guess you're more in charge of this network than Brian is, in charge of the uh, EIR network. So I came to the programme because of lockdown. I was made redundant. I was a lockdown casualty. And I would say I came to the programme because of the power of the network. And it happened to be Brian's power and his network. God, I'm making you sound very powerful now. <laughs> LinkedIn. Uh, my partner saw a vacancy at the university. I was ready to go back to university. I was going to go study psychology. And instead, I've ended up working at the university. I was meant to be here part time and I enjoyed it so much. I stayed. What is your role then within the network? I, I know, I'm joking here sort of saying you're, you're essentially in charge of it and you're making sure that Brian and all of his many cohorts behave themselves. But what, what is your role there? OK, so my role, you have to bear with me on this. It's a bit like an elite dating agent. There's no <laughs> dating on my watch whatsoever I promise you <laughs> but it's all about relationship management so it's connecting it's connecting with our entrepreneurs and residents and really getting to know them and getting to know their backstories who they are as people it's getting to know the academics and understanding what their requirements are what it is that they're looking for and knowing the students and I match make every day my job I connect people so it's all about communication so it sounds perfect then to ask you the same question I asked Brian about your take on sustainability in business and what the attitude you've come across with uh, on all the many relationships that you've built with the EARs and the networks. So to me, sustainability, it's about your core values. It's who you are as people. It's not an add-on. It is who you are. And this is one of the things that I've really come to learn with the Pentland Centre. It's people's beliefs. And one of the things that I find really powerful is, and this is something that Jan and her team do, you make complex issues really, really easy and really manageable. So rather than people getting overwhelmed in the ideology of things and thinking it's too big for me to do, getting fixed up with governance, you know, it's really about what can we do with the day-to-day actions and making things accessible. And that's something that's really helped our EIRs and made it very real. So we've got people within our organisation that have now got B Corp and that has come through the Pentland Centre as well and the inspiration that they've had. There's another sort of logo, so B Corp, which we um, we may talk about in a, a future podcast, I have in mind somebody to ask, is um, Benefit Corporation. So it's a slightly different legal form of a company whereby you're more self-conscious about your values and, and pro-environmental, pro-social values that support the local community, etc. And you can get certified as being a B Corp. And it was, it was wonderful to see one of the EIRs um, telling us the news um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago that they'd got B Corp status. And I often think of B Corps as being, it's a a framework, probably not dissimilar to the ISO framework that you were talking about, Brian, that carries a sustainability value into the heart of a business. So really reinforcing Selma's point that sustainability, when it works really well, isn't an add-on, it's right at the heart of the heart of the matter, I think. Can I add to that? Because I really like the point you've both just made there. Uh, And I was thinking about, and it's about simplicity. Uh, you open up an ISO document or, or application for B Corp and it probably resembles the, the, the Bible or the Quran. It's just, it's incredible and it appears unattainable. But if we can break it down into terminology and language that people can use and that people can understand and make it into bite sizes so that they can achieve it, I think that's what that, that's going to help far, far, far more in bringing people on that journey rather than just throwing them this big fat document that says go and get on with this. So that sort of clarifies B Corp. One of the things that I've never managed to really grip is what entrepreneurial means. I mean it's sort of like one of those labels that that you attach and it's a great label, I'm entrepreneurial, but but do you have a sense of, and it doesn't have to be a really specific thing and it doesn't have to be boiled down, but but do you have a sense of what is entrepreneurial? How do, how do people think about that phrase and that term? So the term, when I, I started my first business out of necessity when I was 32 years old, I think I was, uh, and I don't think the word entrepreneurial existed then. If it did, it was very little used. Now everybody's an entrepreneur. What is it? I think it's people that have that don't fall at the first hurdle. It's commitment. It's an inquisitiveness to ask questions. And to ask questions, beyond the first answer. Uh, I think everybody around here will know the five whys. Ask why five times and you'll get to the root cause of the problem. It's people who are prepared to work hard and get 
get to the root cause of the problem, that I think that's what entrepreneurial is. And that sets, and it's, that's not a job. Everybody, no matter where you work, if you're of that mindset, you're being entrepreneurial in some way, shape or form. When you think of entrepreneurs, it might be easy to think of people with small businesses, small organisations. Is there a point where you stop being an entrepreneur and you start being some kind of like global owner of a massive corporation and you stopped being an entrepreneur? Or are you still an entrepreneur even if you're Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or someone like that who started off small, worked their way from those ideas, kept pushing, kept developing and have ended up in charge of something huge? I, I think that's a choice that you make. So you, you mentioned Steve Jobs. I've never met the guy. I will never meet the guy. So I don't know how well, one of our entrepreneurs, he's now expanded into Australia from the UK. He's got a, just shot 200 people here. He's now in Australia. He's got, last I spoke to him, 10, 12 bodies over there. Spends a bit of time going, now then does he cease to be entrepreneurial now that he's managing a business across two continents? Or does he allow the functional management of the business to be done by others and he remains sat looking at these, you know, he's, he's always got some of the grind to get through, but does he try and keep his mind free some of the time for this, what else? Are we doing it right? Are we doing it wrong? Should we do it a different way? Where should we be looking next? Should we be consolidating? So I, again, I think that's a mindset that I would say relatively intelligent people make for themselves. It seems there's a difference there as well between being an entrepreneur and being entrepreneurial, because people in any job could ha have an entrepreneurial spirit. It's quite a co common fra phrase that's there. And you can be entrepreneurial in the way you approach certain areas without being an entrepreneur and setting up your own business. We're, we're getting into lots of semantics and I'm worried that Jan's going to start making up words <laughs> like entrepreneurialization or something like that because it sounds to me like the kind of thing you do. It's only a matter of time. But I think what, what that really prompts in my mind is I like the multiple whys. And I suppose you've seen through your interactions with the entrepreneurs and residents as to why sustainability. Why does that come into their part of their journey and their questioning of why, what, where, how? And I'll maybe start with Selma. So sustainability and entrepreneurship, I think they go hand in hand. There's lots of opportunities. I think what the SDGs do is it gives people structure. It gives them a framework. It gives them a language as well. With the Pentland Centre, what it's doing, it's bringing to the forefront all the, and the practical execution of what does it mean. So it gets people thinking continually. And this is why the EIRs have really brought into the Pentland Centre because they think, oh, in my day-to-day -day job, I can do this differently, or we already do this. You know, so it is driven by customers as well, the client values. So we've got an entrepreneur who works in the finance sector, and they're, again, going back to the B Corp, they're going for it because it's a benchmark that shows their customers that their mm -hmm. investments are ethical, they're safe. The consumers are a lot more savvy now. They want more. They don't just want to constantly buy things they care about the origins of it and it goes back to one of the conversations that you had with uh, Duncan Pollard and one of our other entrepreneurs in residence Victor they did a, yeah. a joint publication which featured in 54 degrees I think it was issue 17 <laughs> and they were looking at degrowth and you know the impact of it and does it mean that we just buy less no it doesn't it looks at how the the, the origins how you do things differently and that's what really taps into the entrepreneurial mindset. Ah, that's And that's brilliant. And I know that our entrepreneurs and residents do quite a lot of work with our students. And, and I wonder, it would be great to hear something about that, because if you like, that's bringing their experience into the heart of the educational offering of the university, but also their experience of sustainability and practice into students' understanding of sustainability and theory. Well, this is where the dated agent role comes in handy. <laughs> So for the last two years, we've been doing an MBA challenge with the students. And over a course of three days, we have um, five entrepreneurs each day. And they look at sustainability. They look at the ideation of it. And they create meaningful relationships. So these entrepreneurs will be there to challenge the students. They'll, the students, again, in terms of entrepreneurial mindsets, students are very entrepreneurial. They will connect onto LinkedIn with the entrepreneurs. They will ask them for coaching. They'll ask for mentoring, I'll organize sessions for them. And even when they set up businesses, they'll come to the EIRs. Mm -hmm. We've got um, a student called Glover. He's created a sustainability business. Upsite, they upcycle furniture. 
They've got a collaboration with John's Hospice. You know, and this student, he's been absolutely fantastic. He's been hothoused by many entrepreneurs. And he's even come back to the university to act as a guest lecturer for one of our colleagues. So it's quite a virtuous circle. We're creating future entrepreneurs as well. And the upcycling of furniture is a really smart sustainability action because it makes pieces of furniture more available to people who might have less money, gets things out of landfill and and all of the impacts of that. So that sounds a really super example. Just to add, you have to go to Cole's website, Upsite, to see what he does. It's not a case of taking a cupboard and selling a cupboard. He does fantastic things with his furniture visually. Uh, So value added again. Huge value. Yeah, entrepreneurial. We keep mentioning the entrepreneurs and residents and various things that we do. I think we probably need to talk a bit more about who they are more precisely. So I I mentioned at the very start there, you've got more than 90 entrepreneurs in residence here. Who make up this network? Where where are they from? What experience do they have? And what sectors do they cover, Brian? So from a sector point of view, we cover, and, and things like sectors are how you dice them up. We cover about 19 sectors. Where are they from? The furthest away is living in, she's in Hamilton in New Zealand. Uh, I think if I go the other side, I can get to Thailand and Malaysia. I can do Calgary in Canada that way. Uh, I've got Florida, uh, different parts of the US. So it's a fairly widespread of um, ladies and gentlemen that are part of the cohort. Age range, my youngest is 22 and she runs a business, she's a manufacturing, food manufacturing business of 40 people out in Malaysia. And our eldest are in their mid-70s and they will both remain nameless. Um, <laughs> it's your next door neighbour. It's the right type of... The, the, only, the only requirement we have that they are capable of interacting comfortably with our students. I'm not looking for polished diamonds because polished diamonds are boring. Nobody likes them. They've still got to have a bit of rough on the edge, but it's got to be a means that will uh, interest and engage the students. And beyond that, it's just about everybody's next door neighbour. You talk about engaging with students. They also engage with researchers as as well, of course, here within the school. So what would you say the main desired outcomes you have of someone coming in and being an EIR? So the main desired outcomes, we, we have three opportunities for Lancaster has three opportunities. Teaching support, research engagement, and then there's engagement with the university at a more structural level. Uh, so the other three, and it's not, I, I don't really look at somebody, I don't look at Paul and think, Paul, you'd be great for this, whilst Jan will be best for that. It's getting them in the room and starting to work out, see where they settle. You know, I'm not bothered about being in the student, but I do go to number 10 Downing Street twice a year. So I can talk about that kind of stuff on your behalf when we're at 10 Downing Street. So and that's a realistic example, by the way, as well. We've got a number of boys and girls who do get to places like Downing Street. So... We let them, we have lots of engagement for them, we let them find their level and where they sit comfortably. You'd say, obviously, Downing Street, but then there's the example, of course, of EIRs contributing towards reports that have been submitted to the G7 down in Cornwall. So there, there's big, big impacts with organisations that are known the world over. Uh, we we wrestle that. That was one of those. I'm sure lots... We all think that structurally the world is very organised and it's only us as individuals that's all disorganised, don't we? I remember I was trying to watch the, the rugby on the telly and I got an email from one of our entrepreneurs and residents says, Brian, I've been asked to submit this to the G7. Can you help? So by Sunday afternoon, we had 12 EIRs to contribute to it, four academics, and he had the data on the Monday and submitted it to the G7. For, it's like a pre-submission on the Thursday. Anyway, the paper was accepted. So yes, you know, the, 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 our span of influence is, is far wider than people would think. And the span of influence expands, extends rather to the Pentland Centre. So Salma, how does the relationship between the AIRs and the Pentland Centre work? I would say the relationship works very, very well. It's to me, it's it's a very beautiful partnership. I know I sound like I'm in a cult. <laughs> I, I do it, want it to. It also sounds like you're back on the date. It also sounds like you're back on the dating. Uh, <laughs> you, you've swiped right for Jan, and that's it. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, I'm old school. It's more still a black and dating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't know which direction to swipe, and so I mean, I could I have just guessed. <laughs> it, it could be that I've just rejected you outright by swiping right. So, so yes, the relationship between the Pentland Centre and the entrepreneurs 
It's a very positive relationship that doesn't involve dating. It's given the entrepreneurs in residence opportunity to connect with academics who they otherwise would not have connected with and it's created some wonderful partnerships and it's a great opportunity for people to get to know each other. So relationship building is very, very valuable, especially now that we're in a global place and the world's getting smaller. So it's important that people have these opportunities to connect. So uh, recently, Brian's done a collaboration with Sunway University. We've recruited several EIRs from there. And one of our colleagues, Stephen, we would not have known Stephen had it not have through, been through the Pentland Centre. And what it does, it gives a familiar face for somebody to reach out to. So when Brian's out in Malaysia, I can say, hey, Brian, did you know Stephen <laughs> is available? And Brian's got this great relationship and it just goes from strength to strength. And we've created international lectures. And what that does for the entrepreneurs, it gives them value. Now, they're in organisations that they've created. They're at the top of the game. You know, they've had lots of lives like cats. <laughs> you know, some have boomed, some have busted, and they're constantly rebuilding themselves. It's not always worthy about monetary reward. And this is something that gives them the opportunity to really do reflective pieces on themselves as well and really engage at a different level with people. And I'd, I'd really uh, second what Selma said there because the IR is a network, Pentland Centre is a network, so it's sort of a network of a networks and, and it's a really nice way for people to connect with each other and, as you say, to get credit for what they're doing. And, and also, when you get credit for what you're doing, you often think with that entrepreneurial mindset that Brian was talking about, well, maybe I could do it a bit better again. And I think that's a nice way forward. But also, I'd, I'd use the word inspiration as well, because it's possible to do really amazing things. And I think the, the EIRs give us that opportunity. And I, I always like um, uh, interacting with them because their their stories are great and you know, they do really interesting and vibrant things. And particularly for the ones that are maybe based around Lancaster, I see them at a, a variety of sort of sustainability do's and other sorts of contexts as well. So I think that dating agency, getting to know people, having chats, having repeat chats, having a further chat again, is a really nice feature of both the EIRs and the Pentland Centre. So just to pick up, Jan, on, on what yourself and Sam would have said there, you talked about your experience in meeting a number of entrepreneurs and residents and like-minded people at events around Lancaster. One of the benefits, I think, and, and certainly in my time since I've come into academia, there's a big fat echo chamber goes on around here, uh, which tells us all that we're great. But within business as well, the, there's that echo chamber of those people at university, uh, they're, 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 they know too much, they're too far up themselves, we don't need to worry about them. And it's slowly, or what we're doing with the Pentland Centre and the Entrepreneurs and Residents, you, 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 can't, you can't force a relationship. A relationship is slowly building and developing. It will extend beyond Lancaster because of the nature of the Entrepreneurs and Residents. And what I like, apart from getting rid of the echo chamber idea is let's hear what's happening with sustainability in Malaysia and now then the tiny bit I know about that which is nothing so um, is that the Malaysian government is trying to do a lot and is relatively popular with the efforts that they're doing but their 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 needs and requirements are different from what's considered first world Great Britain right now so we get to find balance as well as finding great ideas in other parts of the world that we can bring back here and do something slightly different with. So I think that relationship offers a really good long, long, long term sustainable benefit for everybody. One of the things I liked about that, because, of course, Malaysia is not unconnected to the UK yeah. in terms of their plantation industry and materials that come through into our food system. So the more international understanding we have, the more local understanding we have as well, I, I would argue. And to add to Brian's point about the entrepreneurs in residence, uh, one, uh, to quote one of our EIRs, he acts as an irritant. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, it's quite important that the university isn't just an echo chamber and it's not just all about theory. These people are the ones that are breathing life into the theory. They're there to challenge, to provoke the students and to say, this is what happens in real life. And... That's really valuable 
to the students and to the entrepreneurs because they get to reflect, and which is something that they might not be able to do every single day in their day jobs because they're time starved. You know, and entrepreneurs in residence to the university, it's really important. And the reason is it's like having a dance school without dancers or an art school without artists. So it's <laughs> Yeah, I like that analogy. That's a really nice metaphor. And in the mixing between academia and practice, um, I think that's a really great way to go. And Brian, you've got a PhD underway, which by definition is going to have academic elements to it, but I suspect it will have really great practice elements as well. So if you just tell us a little bit about your PhD. Coming from a practitioner background, one would hope that it's got some practical value. However, I do understand it's got to stand up with some uh, academic rigour as well. So my research is around the concept of fear and fear in business. Ah. Now then, um, fear, fear, fear is something that the business people and entrepreneurs experience on a daily basis. They will experience it 10 times a day from 10 different subjects. It's about how you ma- the successful business people are able to manage that, and it's how they manage that. Now then, my research has pointed very definitely towards networks, and it's how successful people not just business people, how successful people utilise their networks to manage that fear. Some stuff that's coming through is that there's one reason, and one of the things that, that's interested me since the start is when, when I set out thinking about this is at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of those people that are in business were my friends because I'd just uh, sold my company a couple of years, a year before. What is it that makes them get up every morning don their armour, pick up their shield and their sword, knowing they were going to lose the fight today, doing it on such a regular basis. And that was kind of ethos. I'm still there. That's a why. And one of the things that's coming through, uh, as is yet, is, of course, unpublished, so therefore uh, doesn't count, is that if we don't help each other, the problems the individual pulls to my left, the problems Paul's experiencing, the, my research has showed that if we don't help each other, Paul's problems will contaminate us all around the table eventually. So as a network, we know actually it's in our interest to help Paul straight off. And this is almost a subliminal thing. This isn't a, this isn't a conscious decision that people are making. We know that unless we help Paul, we'll suffer from the same problem. So it's worth investing time now. So... I'm looking at that and, and, and I've got terms around entrepreneurial fear that's about managing that fear, how we manage our day-to-day small problems and big problems because the rest of life still needs to go on. And that's absolutely awesome because it seems to me that that's a really good analogy for sustainability in business as well, is that any one problem that one person faces, someone else is bound to and the power of a network at really bringing that forward or even you you might have a problem in manufacturing but actually the solution rests in in the world of consumers. So I think that's a really nifty PhD topic that we can surely subvert to sustainability in business as well. There's nothing new here. You know, we're reinventing the wheel in as much as, you know, how do we continue to create cleaner rivers again? We know how clean rivers work. It's our choice to pollute them or not to clean them up as quickly as we want. So all the answers are there already. Jan, yeah. it's about the, 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 the energy and the urgency to do something about it. Yeah. And I can see Selma relaxing at this point, which is very unwise, because I want to know when she's going to start doing a PhD in this area. But, me too, Jan. Yeah. <laughs> when you take me on, Jan. Well, there we are. That sounds, I think I'd better pass back to you, Paul, because we're dating again. <laughs> what? I, I, I really missed something there. That I, I'm still growing on the fact I'm a contaminant, according to, to Brian. <laughs> Uh, spreading my uh, odorous influence across uh, uh, all society. Maybe that's what this podcast was all about in the first place. Uh, and on that note, oh, Brian, I was about to say we're going to wrap up, but you obviously want to call me a contaminant or something worse. No, 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 I take the contaminant thing back. I'm, I'm sure it's not wholly justified, perhaps only partially. But no, uh, we talked about, so I would love to chuck a question back at you guys. Universities are great for having meetings where nothing happens, aren't they? But lots of organisations are, so we're not just playing the university. So what I'd like to know is, uh, your thoughts, something that we can come back to in maybe 12 months or two years, how could the Pentland Centre and the entrepreneurs in residence, in a very slow and deliberate way, benefit each other more in the short-term future, please? I think there's layers to it. The first one is inspiration. So particularly highlighting 
what I'd often call pockets of the future and the present because things that we're doing now that look a bit odd but we're going to be really sensible as the environment and social conditions change around us, those examples of what will fit the future really well is already in the present and I think the entrepreneurial mindset is where some of these ideas are. So I think there's uh, pockets of future in the present is, is one thing that we be able to systematise, understand and really figure out how that comes into being. I think we can also, as an, and that's, if you like, be really interesting to the Pentland Centre, but I also think there's an offer that as issues and problems pop up, to be able to decode them and um, understand them in a more straightforward and simple way. And I, I really, you know, thank you, Selma, for thinking that I make things simple. I, I do try, but you never quite know if you exactly. achieve it. <laughs> um, um, so actually, you know, what are the leading edge of the problems that people are trying to tackle? So we know one that's going to be coming forward, which is the government in a whole variety of contexts. And they've just delayed it a bit further because I think they don't know how to do it, which is a really good reason um, to, to involve research, is how do you be a net positive business. So it's net zero carbon, but it's net positive on biodiversity. So that is a huge big pot of stuff that we have some ideas about that some of our researchers are looking on you know, quite particularly. And one of the elements of that is that you can only do that in a particular place. So it seems to me that a Lancaster pod of entrepreneurs and residents, we can actually help answer that question. So I think it's, it's in both of those directions. That sounds fabulous. Well, let's do it then. So let's put them in a petri dish and see what happens. <laughs> All right, well, the whole world is a petri dish. <laughs>Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Brian and Salma. And next time, Jan, we're going to be talking to Dr. Caroline Lord about, among other things, sustainability fairy tales, urban sustainability transitions, and as far as I'm aware, nothing to do with EARs and contamination or whatever it is we've just spent the last <laughs> half hour talking about. Because at points here, I've just my mind's gone. We shall, but there will be some nice crossover points about how do you find out about the world, how do you transfer that understanding somewhere else in the world. So I think there's a nice continuity to come. And how it can be practically applied. Exactly. Until then, I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jane Barrington. <laughs>